Hi, I know it's been a while. I have skipped again. I know, I know, because I wasn't well. I had. Even now, I am not completely fine. But then, I am going to read, and let me just check whether the stream is on. Then we'll start. Yeah, I know that, but it's working. Just a minute. Checking. YouTube. It's been a while, man. I know. I know it's been a while. Is it working? Is it working? Is it not working? Let's see. Yeah, so Twitch is working. Yeah. YouTube is working. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's start up. Huh? Both of them are working. Please message or comment if there is any problem in the stream in between and you're watching. There is any suggestion of like re reading any other book, re reading any other chapter which was not clearly audible or visible in the stream. There was some network problem or whatever the reason. I can do that. Do tell me if there is any such suggestion. Let's start with the reading. Part two of the book, Brief History of Humankind, Sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. Part two, The Agricultural Revolution. Till now we had read Cultural Cognitive Revolution. Now we are on the Agricultural Revo Revolution. This, is, this picture is of the wall painting from an Egyptian grave dated about 3500 years ago. Depicting typical agricultural scenes. Yeah, we can see them. There is a cow as well in the background. Yeah. Chapter 5, History's Biggest Fraud. For 2.5 million years, humans fed themselves by gathering plants and hunting animals that lived and bred without their intervention. Homo erectus, Homo ergaster and the Neanderthals plugged with wild figs and hunted wild sheep without deciding where fig trees would take root, in which meadow a herd of sheep would graze, or which billy goat would inseminate which, which nanny goat. Homo sapiens spread from East Africa to the Middle East, to Europe and Asia, and finally to Australia and America. But everywhere they went, sapiens too continued to live by gathering wild plants and hunting wild animals. Why do anything else when your lifestyle feeds you a pl why do anything else when your lifestyle feeds you amply and supports a rich world of social structures, religious beliefs and political dynamics? All this changed about 10,000 years ago when sapiens began to devote almost all their time and efforts to manipulating the lives of a few animal and plant species. From sunrise to sunset, Human sowed seeds, watered plants, plugged weeds and from the ground and led sheep to prime pastures. This work, they thought, would provide them with more fruit, grain and meat. It was a revolution in the way humans li lived. The Agricultural Revolution The transition to agriculture began around 9500 to 8500 BC in the hill country of southern, southern, southeastern Turkey, Western Iran, and the Levant. It began slowly and in a restricted geographical area. Wheat and goats were domesticated by approximately 900 BC. Peas and lentils around 8000 BC, olive trees by 5000 BC, horses by 4000 BC, and grapevines in 3500 BC. 
some animals and plants such as camels and cashew nuts were domesticated even later but by 3500 bc the main wave of domestication was over even today with all our advanced technologies more than 90% of the calories that fed that feed humanity come from the handful of plants that our ancestors domesticated between 9500 and 3500 bc wheat rice maize called corn in the us potatoes millets and barley no noteworthy plant or animal has been domesticated in the last 2000 years in our mind if our mind are those of hunter gatherers our cuisine is that of ancient farmers scholars once believed that agriculture spread from a single middle eastern point of origin to the four corners of the world today scholars agree that agriculture sprang up in other parts of the world not by the action of Middle Eastern farmers exploring their revolution, but entirely independently. Independently, people in Central America domesticated maize and beans without knowing anything about wheat and pea cultivation in the Middle East. South Americans learned how to raise potatoes and lamb llamas, unaware of what was going on in either Mexico or the Levant. China's first revolutionaries domesticated rice, millets, and pigs. North America's first gardeners were those who got tired of combining the undergrowth for edible goods and decided to cultivate pumpkins. New Guineans tamed sugarcane and bananas, while the first West African farmers made African millet, African rice, sorghum, and wheat. conform to their needs from these initial focal points agricultural agriculture spread far and wide by the 1st century ad the vast majority of people throughout the most of the world were agriculturalists <coughs> why did agricultural revolution erupt in the middle east china and central america but not in australia alaska or south africa the reason is simple Most species of plants and animals can't be domesticated. Sapiens could dig up delicious truffles and hunt down woolly mammoths, but domesticating either species was out of the question. The fungi were far too elusive, the giant bees too ferocious of the thousands of species that our ancestors hunted and gathered. Only a few were suitable candidates for farming and herd- herding. those few species lived in particular places and those are the places where agricultural revolutions occurred scholars once proclaimed that the agricultural revolution was a great leap forward for humanity they told a tale of progress fueled by human brain power evolutions gradually produced ever ever more intelligent people eventually people were so smart that they were they were all able to decipher nature's secrets enabling them to tame sheep and cultivate wheat as soon as this happened they had cheerfully abandoned the grueling dangerous and often spartan life of hunter gatherers settling down to enjoy the pleasant satiated life of farmers areas the red areas are where independent agricultural revolutions happened and blue areas in which independent agricultural revolution might have happened might have happened <coughs> the map shows locations and dates of agricultural revolution the data is contentious and the map is constantly being redrawn to incorporate the latest archaeological discoveries okay the that tale is a fantasy there is no evidence that people became more intelligent with time foragers knew the secrets of nature long before the agricultural revolution since their survival depended on an intimate knowledge of the animals they hunted and the plants they gathered rather than heralding a new era of easy living the agricultural revolution left farmers with life generally more difficult and less satisfying than those of foragers hunter gatherers spent their time in more simul- si- simulating and varied ways and were less in danger of starvation and disease the agricultural revolution certainly and la- allows the sum of total food at the disposal of human kind but the extra food did not translate into a better diet or more leisure rather it translated into population expansion and pampered elites the average farmer worked harder than the average forager and got a worse diet in return 
the agricultural revolution was history's biggest fraud. Who was responsible? Neither kings, nor priests, nor merchants. The culprits were a handful of plant species, including wheat, rice, potatoes. These plants domesticated Homo sapiens rather than vice versa. Think for a moment about the agricultural revolution from the viewpoint of wheat. 10,000 years ago, wheat was just a wild grass, one of many confined to a small range in the Middle East. Suddenly, within just a few mi- short millennia, it was growing all over the world according to the basic evolutionary criteria for survival and reproduction. Wheat has become one of the most successful plants in the history of the world. In areas such as the Great Plains of North America, where not a single wheat stalk grew 10,000 years ago, you can today walk for hundreds upon hundreds of kilometers without encountering any other plant. Worldwide, wheat covers about 2.25 million square kilometer of the globe's surface, almost 10 times the size of Britain. How did this grass turn from insignificant to ubiquitous? We did it by manipulating Homo sapiens to its advantage. This ape had been living a fairly comfortable life hunting and gathering until about 10,000 years ago, but then began to invest more and more efforts in cultivating wheat. Within a couple of millennia, humans in many parts of the world were doing little from dawn to dusk other than taking care of wheat plants. It wasn't easy. Wheat demanded a lot of them. We didn't like rocks and pebbles, so sapiens broke their backs, clearing the field. We didn't like sharing its space, water and nutrients with other plants, so men and women labored long days, wedding under the scorching sun. We got sick, so sapiens had to keep a watch out for worms and blight. Wheat was defenseless against other organisms that liked to eat it, from rabbits to locust worms, so the farmers had to guard and protect it. Wheat was thirsty, so humans lugged water from springs and streams to water it. Its hunger even impelled sapiens to collect animal feces to nourish the ground in which wheat grew. The body of Homo sapiens had not evolved for such tasks. It was adapted to climbing apple trees and running after gazelles, not to clearing rocks and carrying water buckets. Human spines, knees, necks and arches paid the price. Studies of ancient skeletons indicate that the transition to agriculture brought about a plethora of ailments such as slip discs, arthritis, hernias. Moreover, the new agricultural tasks demanded so much time that people were forced to settle permanently next to their wheat field. This completely changed their way of life. We did not domesticate wheat, it domesticated us. The word domesticate comes from the Latin domus, which means house. Who's the one living in a house? Not the wheat, it's the sapiens. How did wheat convince Homo sapiens to exchange a rather good life for a more miserable existence? What did it offer in return? Did it not offer a better diet? Remember, humans are omnivorous apes who thrive on a wide variety of food, grains made up only a small fraction of the human diet before the agricultural revolution. A diet based on cereals is poor in minerals and vitamins, hard to digest, really bad for your teeth and gums. Wheat did not give people economic security. The life of a peasant is less secure than that of a hunter-gatherer. Foragers relied on dozens of species to survive and could therefore weather, weather difficult years even without could therefore weather difficult years with even without stocks of preserved food if the availability of one species were reduced they could gather and hunt more of other species farming societies have until very recently relied for the great bulk of their calorie intake on the small variety of domesticated plants in many areas they relied on just a single staple such as wheat potatoes rice or rice. If the rains failed or clouds of locust, locusts arrived or if the fungus learned how to infect that staple species, peasants died by a thousand and millions. Nor could wheat offer security against human violence. The early farmers were at least as violent as the foragers' ancestors, if not more so. Farmers had more pas- possessions and needed land for planting. The loss of pasture land to raiding 
neighbors could mean the difference between subsistence and salvation so there was much less room for compromise compromise when a foraging band was hard pressed by a strong rival it could usually move on it was difficult and dangerous but it was feasible when a strong enemy threatened an agricultural village retreat meant giving up fields houses and granaries in many cases this doomed the refugees to starvation farmers therefore tended to stay put and fight to the bitter end this picture is showing tribal warfare in new guinea between two farming communities 1960 such scenes were probably widespread in thousands of years following the agricultural revolution oh damn many anthropological and archaeological studies indicate that in simple agricultural society with no political framework beyond village and tribe human violence was responsible for about 15% of deaths including 25% of male death in contemporary new guinea violence accounts for 30% of male deaths in one agricultural tribal society the dani and 35% in another the enga enga in yukador perhaps 50% of adult waranis meet a violent death at the hand of another human in time human violence was brought under control through the development of larger social frameworks cities kingdoms and states but it took thousands of years to build such huge and effective political structures village life certainly brought the first farmers some immediate benefits such as better protection against wild animals rain and cold yet for the average person the disadvantages probably outweighed the advantages this is hard for people in today's prosperous societies to appreciate since we enjoy affluence and security and since our affluence and security are built on foundations laid by the agricultural revolution we assume that the agricultural revolution was a wonderful improvement yet it is wrong to judge thousands of years of history from the perspective of today a much more representative viewpoint is that of a 3 year old girl dying from malnutrition in first century china because her father's crops have failed would she say i'm dying from malnutrition but in 2000 years people will have plenty to eat and live in big air conditioned houses so my suffering is a worthwhile sacrifice what then did we offer agriculturalists including the malnourished chinese girls it offered nothing for people as individuals yet it did bestow something on homo sapiens as a species cultivating wheat provided much more food per unit of territory and thereby enabled homo sapiens to multiply multiply exponentially around 13000 bc when people fed themselves by gathering wild plants and hunting wild animals the area around the oasis of jericho in palestine could support at most one roaming band of about 100 relatively healthy and well nourished people around 8500 bc when wild plants gave way to wheat fields the oasis supported a large but cramped villages of 1000 people who suffered far more from diseases and malnourishment The currency of evolution is neither hunger nor pain but rather copies of DNA helixes just as the economic success, success of a company is measured only by the number of dollars in its bank account not by the happiness of its employees so the evolutionary success of this species is measured by the number of copies of its DNA if no more DNA copy remains the species is extinct just as a company without money is bankrupt If a species boasts many DNA copies, it is a success, and the species fl- flourish. From such a perspective, thousand copies are always better than a hundred copies. This is the essence of the agricultural revolution: the ability to keep more people alive under worse condition. Yet, yet, why should individuals care about this evolutionary calculus? Why would any sane person lower his or her standard of living just to multiply the number of copies of the Homo sapiens genome? Nobody agreed to this deal. The agricultural revolution was a trap, the luxury trap. The rise of farming was a gradual affair spread over centuries and millennia. A band of Homo sapiens gathering mushrooms and nuts and hunting deer and rabbit did not all of a sudden settle in a permanent village. plowing field sowing wheat and carrying water from the river the change proceeded by stages 
each of which involved just a small alterations in daily life. Homo sapiens reached the Middle East and 70,000 years ago for the next 50,000 years our ancestors flourished there without agriculture. The natural resources of the area were enough to support its human population. In time of plenty people in time of plenty people had a few more children and in times of need a few less. Humans like many mammals have hormonal and genetic mechanisms that help control procreation. In good times, females reach puberty early, earlier and their chances of getting pregnant are a bit higher. In bad times, puberty is late and fertility decreases. To these natural population controls were added cultural mechanisms. Babies and small children who move slowly and demand much attention were a burden on nomadic foragers. People tried to space their child three to four years apart. Women did so by nursing their children around the clock and until a late age. Around the clock, suckling significantly decreases the chances of getting pregnant. Other methods included full or partial sexual abstinence, backed perhaps by cultural taboos, abortion and occasionally infanticide. During these long millennia, people occasionally ate wheat grain, but this was a marginal part of their diet. About 18,000 years ago, the last ice age gave way to a period of global warming. As temperatures rose, so did rainfall. The new climate was ideal for Middle Eastern wheat and other cereals, which multipli- multiplied and spread. People began eating more wheat and in exchange, they inadvertently spread its growth. Since it was impossible to eat wild grains without first winnowing, grinding and cooking them, People who gathered these grains carried them back to their temporary campsite for processing. Wheat grains are small and numerous, so some of them inevitably fell on the way to the campsite and were lost. Over time, more and more wheat grew along favorite human traits and near campsites. When humans burned down forests and thickets, that also helped peat. Fire cleared away trees and shrubs, allowing wheat and other grasses to monopolize the sunlight, water and nutrients, where wheat became particularly abundant and game and other food resources were also plentiful. Human bands could gradually give up their nomadic lifestyle and settle down in seasonal and even permanent camps. At first, they might have camped for four weeks during the harvest. A generation later, as wheat plants multiplied and spread, the harvest camp might have lasted for five weeks, then six, and finally it became a permanent village. Evidence of such settlements has been discovered throughout the Middle East, particularly in the Levant, where the Natofian culture flourished from 12,500 BC to 9,500 BC. The Natofians were hunter-gatherers who subsisted on dozens of wild species, but they lived in permanent villages and devoted much of their time to the intensive gathering and processing of wild cereals. They built stone houses and granaries. They stopped. They stored grains for f- times of need. They invented new tools such as stone scythes for harvesting wild wheat and stone pestles and mortars to grind it. In the years following 9500 BC, the descendants of the Natufian continued to gather and process cereals, but they also began to cultivate them in more and more elaborate ways. When gathering wild grains, they took care of lay aside part of the harvest to sow the field next season. They discovered that they could achieve much better result by sowing the grains deep in the ground rather than haphazardly scattering them on the surface. So they began to hoe and plug. Gradually, they also started to weed the fields to guard them against parasites and to water and fertilize them. As more effort was directed towards cereal cultivation, there was less time to gather and hunt wild species. The foragers became the farmers. No single step separated the women gathering wild wheat from the women farming domesticated wheat. So it's hard to say exactly when the decisive transition to agriculture took place, but by 8500 BC, the Middle East was peppered with permanent villages such as Jericho, whose inhabitants spent most of their time cultivating a few domesticated species. With the move to permanent villages and the increase in food supply, the population began to grow. 
Giving up their nomadic lifestyle enabled women to have a child every year. Babies were weaned at an earlier age, so they could be fed on porridge and gruel. The extra hands were sorely needed in the fields, but the extra mouths quickly wiped out the food surpluses, so even more fields had to be planted. As people began living in disease-ridden settlements, as children fed more on cereals and less on mother's milk, and as ch- each child competed for his or her porridge with more and more siblings, child mortality soared. In most agricultural societies, at least one out of every three children died before reaching 20. Yet the increase in birth still outpaced the increase in deaths. Humans kept having larger number of children. With time, the weed bargain became more and more burdensome. Children died in droves, and adults ate bread by the sweat of their brews. The average person in Jericho of 8500 BC lived a harder life than the average person in Jericho of 9500 BC or 13000 BC. But nobody realized what was happening. Every generation continued to live like the previous generation, making only small improvements here and there in the way things were done. Paradoxically, a series of improvements, each of which was meant to make life easier, added up to a milestone around the neck of these farmers. Why did people make such a fateful miscalculation? For the same reason that people throughout history have miscalculated, people were unable to fathom the full consequence of these their decisions. Whenever they decided to do a bit of extra work, say to hoe the field instead of scattering speeds on the surface, people thought, yes, we will have to work harder, but the harvest will be so bountiful. We won't have to worry anymore about lean ears. Our children will never go to sleep hungry. It made sense. If you worked harder, you would have a better life. That was the plan. The first part of the plan went smoothly. People indeed worked harder, but people did not foresee that the number of children would increase meaning that the extra wheat would have to be shared between more children. Neither did the early farmers understand that feeding children with more porridge and less breast milk would weaken their immune system and that permanent settlements would be hotbeds for infectious diseases. They did not foresee that by increasing their dependence on a single source of food, they were actually exposing themselves even more to the depredations of drought nor did the farmers foresee that in good years their bulging granaries would tempt them tempt thieves and un- enemies compelling them to start building walls and doing guard duty then why didn't human abandon farming when the plan backfired partly because it took generations for the small changes to accumulate and transform society and by then nobody remembered that they had ever lived differently and partly because population growth burned humanity's boats. If the adoption of plowing increased a village's population from 100 to no, no, which 10 people would have volunteered to starve so that others could go back to the good old times, there was no going back. The trap, trap snapped shut. The pursuit of an easier life resulted in much hardship and not for the last time. It happened to us, happens to us today. How many young college graduates have taken demanding jobs in high power, high power firms, knowing that they will work hard to earn money that will enable them to retire and pursue their real interests when they are 35? But by the time they reach that age, they have large mortgages, children to school, houses in suburbs that necessitate at least two cars per family, and a sense that life is not worth living without really good wine and expensive holiday abroad. What are they supposed to do? Go back to digging up roots? No. They double their efforts and keep slaving away. One of history's few iron laws is that luxuries tend to become necessities to spawn and to spawn new ag- obligations. Once people get used to a certain luxury, they take it for granted. Then they begin to count on it. Finally, they reach a point where they can't live without it. Let's take another familiar example from our own time. Over the last few decades, we have invented countless time-saving devices that are supposed to make life more relaxed. Washing machine, vacuum cleaner, dishwashers, telephones, mobiles, computers, email. Previously, it took a lot of work to write a letter, address, and stamp an envelope, take it to the mailbox. It took days or weeks, maybe even months to get a reply. Nowadays, I, da- I can dash off an email, send it halfway around the globe, and if my addressee is online, receive a reply a minute later. 
I have saved all the trouble and time, but do I live a more relaxed life? Sadly, not. Back in the small mail, snail mail era, people usually only wrote letters when they had something important to relate, rather than writing the first thing that came into their heads. They considered carefully what they wanted to say and how to phrase it. They expected to receive a similarly considerate answer. Most people wrote and received no more than a handful of letters a month and seldom felt compelled to reply immediately. Today I receive dozens of emails each day all from people who expect a prompt reply. We thought we were saving time instead we revved up the treadmill of life of 10 to 10 times its former speed and made our days more anxious and agitated. Here and there a luddite luddite holdout refuses to open a email account just as thousands of years ago some human bands refused to take up farming and so escape the luxury trap but the agricultural revolution didn't need every band in a given region to join up it only took one only one band settled down and started tilting whether in the middle east or central america agriculture was irresistible Since farming created the conditions for swift demographic growth, farmers could usually overcome foragers by sheer weight of numbers. The foragers could either run away, abandoning their hunting grounds to field and pasture, or take up the pluck share themselves. Either way, the old life was doomed. The story of the luxury trap carries with it an important lesson. Humanity's search for an easier life released immense force of change that transformed the world in ways nobody envisioned or wanted. Nobody plotted that in agricultural revolution or sought human dependence or see on cereal cultivation. A cereal series of trivial decisions aimed mostly at filling a few stomachs and gaining a little security had the cumulative effort effect of forging had the cumulative effect of forcing ancient foragers to spend their days carrying water buckets under a scorching sun divine intervention the above scenario explains the agricultural revolution as a miscalculation it's very plausible history is full far full of far more idiotic miscalculations but there's only possibility there's only another possibility Maybe it wasn't the search for an easier life that brought about the transformation. Maybe sapiens had other aspirations and were consciously willing to make their lives harder in order to achieve them. Scientists usually seek to tra- attribute historical developments to cold economic and demographic factors. It sits better with their rational and mathematical methods. In the case of modern history, scholars cannot avoid taking into account non-material factors like ideology and culture. The written evidence forces their hand. We have enough documents, letters, and memoirs to prove that the World War Two was not caused by food shortage or demographic pressures. But we have no documents from the Nat- Natufian culture. So, when dealing with ancient periods, the materialist school reigns supreme. It is difficult to prove that pre-literate people were motivated by faith rather than economic necessity. Yet, in some rare cases, we are lucky enough to find. Telltale clues. In 1995, archaeologists began to excavate a site in the southeast Turkey called Gobekli Tepe. In the oldest stratum, they discovered no signs of a settlement, houses, or daily activity. They did, however, find monumental pillared, pillared structures decorated with spectacular engravings. Each stone pillar weighed. up to 7 tons and reached a height of 5 meters in a nearby quarry they found a half chisel pillar weighing 50 tons altogether they uncovered more than 10 monumental structures the largest of them nearly 30 meters across archaeologists are familiar with such monumental structures from site around the world and the best known example is stonehenge in britain yet as they studied gobekli tepe they discovered an amazing fact Stonehenge dates to 2500 BC and was built by a developed agricultural society. The structures at Gobekli Tepe are dated about 9500 BC and all available evidence indicates that they were built by hunter gatherers. The archaeological community initially found it difficult to credit these findings, but one test after another confirmed both the early dates of these structures and the pre-agricultural society of their builders. 
the capabilities of ancient foragers and the complexity of their culture seem to be far more impressive than was previously suspected. This picture is opposite the remains of an a monumental remain from Gobekli Tepe, right? One of the decorated stone pillars about five meters high. That is good, yaar. And it weighs seven ton or more. Why would a foraging society build such structures? They had no obvious utilitarian purpose. They were neither mammoth slaughterer houses nor places to shelter from rain or hide from lions. That leaves us with the theory that they were built for some mysterious cultural purposes that archaeologists have a hard time deciphering. Whatever it was, the foragers thought it worth a huge amount of effort and time. The only way to build Gobekli Tepe was, a th was for thousands of foragers belonging to different bands and tributes to cooperate over an extended period of time. Only a sophisticated religious or ideological system could sustain such efforts. True. Gobekli Tepe held another sensational secret. For many years, genetics have been tracing the origins of domesticated weeds. Recent discoveries indicate that at least one domesticated variant, einkorn weed, originally needed, originated in the Karakadig Hills, about 30 kilometers from Gobekli Tepe. This can hardly be a coincidence. It's likely that the cultural center of Gobekli Tepe was somehow connected to the initial domestication of wheat by humankind and of humankind by wheat. In order to feed the people who built and used the monumental structures, particularly large quantities of food were required, it may well be that foragers switched from gathering wild wheat to intense wheat cultivation, not to increase their normal food supply, but rather to support the buildings and running of a temple. In the conventional picture, pioneer first, pioneers first built a village and when it prospered, they set up a temple in the middle but Gobekli Tepe suggests that the temple may have been built first and the villagers later grew up around it. Victims of the Revolution The Faustian bargain between humans and grains was not the only deal our species made. Another deal was struck concerning the fate of animals such as sheep, goats, pigs and chickens. Nomadic bands that stalked wild sheep gradually altered the constitution of herd on which they preyed. This process probably began with selective hunting. Humans learned that it was to their advantage to hunt only adult rams and old or sick sheep. They spared fertile females and young lambs in order to safeguard the long-term vitality of the local herd. The second step might have been to actively defend the herd against predators, driving away lions, wolves and river rival human bands. The band might next have corralled the herd into a narrow gorge in order to better control and defend it. Finally, people began to make a more careful selection among the sheep in order to traitor them, tailor them to human needs. The most aggressive rams, those that showed the greatest resist resistance to human control, were slaughtered first. So were the skinniest and most inquisitive females. Shepherds are not fond of sheep whose curiosity takes them far from the herd. With each passing generation, the sheep became fatter, more submissive and less curious. Voila, Mary had a la little lamb and everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. Alternatively, hunters may have caught and adopted a lamb, fattening it during the months of plenty and slaughtering it in the leaner season. At some stage, they began keeping a great number of such lambs. Some of these reached puberty and began to procreate. The most aggressive and unruly lamb were first to get to the slaughter. The most submissive, most appealing lambs were allowed to live longer and procreate. The result was a herd of domesticated and submissive sheep. Such domesticated animals, sheep, chicken, donkeys and others supplied food, meat, milk, eggs, raw material, skin and wools, and muscle power, the transportation, plowing, grinding and other tasks hitherto 
performed by human sinew were increasingly carried out by animals in most farming societies people focused on plant cultivation raising animals was a secondary activity but a new kind of society also appeared in some places based primarily on the exploitation of animals tribes of pastoralist herds herders as humans spread around the world so did their domesticated animals 10000 years ago not more than a few million sheep cattle goat bulls and chickens lived in restricted afro asian niche today the world contained about a billion sheep a billion pigs more than a billion cattle and more than 25 billion chickens and they are all over the globe the domesticated chicken is the most widespread fowl ever following homo sapiens domesticated cattle pigs and sheep are the second third and fourth most widespread large mammals in the world from a narrow evolutionary perspective which measures success by the number of dna copies the rev- agricultural revolution was a wonderful boon for chickens cattle pigs and sheep unfortunately the evolutionary perspective is an incomplete measure of success it judges everything by the criteria of survival and reproduction with no regard for individual suffering and happiness domesticated chicken and cattle may well be an evolutionary success story but they are also among the most miserable creatures that ever lived the domestication of animals was founded on a series of brutal practices that only became crueler with the passing of the centuries the natural lifespan of wild chicken is about 7 to 12 years and cattle about 20 to 25 years in the wild most chicken and cattle died long before that but they still had a fair chance of living for a respectable number of years in contrast the vast majority of domesticated cattle and chickens are slaughtered at the age of between a few weeks and a few months because this has always been the optimal sp- slaughtering age from an economic perspective Why keep feeding a cock for 3 years if it has already reached its maximum weight after 3 months? Egg laying hens, dairy cows and drought animals are sometimes allowed to live for many years, but the price is subjugation to a way of life completely alien to their urges and desires. It's reasonable to assume for example that bulls prefer to spend their time di- days wandering over open prairies prairies in the company of other bulls and cows rather than pulling the carts and plug shares under the yoke of a whip wielding ape in order to turn bulls horses donkeys and camels into obedient draught animals their natural instincts and social ties had to be broken their aggression and sexuality contained and their freedom of movement curtailed farmers developed techniques such as locking animals inside pens and cages bridling them them with an in harnesses and leashes training them with whips and cattle prods and mutilating them the process of taming almost always involves the castration of males they restrain male ag- this restrains male aggression and enables human selectively to control the herd's procreation a painting from an egypt grave this uh, s- uh, century 1200 bc a pair of oxygen plugging uh, oxen plugging a field in the wild cattle roamed as they pleasured in herds in with a complex social structure the castered castrated and domesticated ox wasted away his life under the lash and in a narrow pen laboring alone or in pairs in a way that suited neither its body nor its social and emotional needs when an ox could no longer pull the plow it was slaughtered note the hunched position of the egyptian farmer who much like the ox spent his life in hard labor oppressive to his body his mind and his social relationships in many new genian societies the wealth of a person has traditionally been determined by the number of pigs he or she owns the, to ensure that the pigs can't run away farmers in northern new genia slice off a chunk of each pig's nose this causes severe pain where the pig tries to sniff Since the pig cannot find food or even find their way around without sniffing, their mutilation makes them completely dependent on their human owner. In another area of New Guinea, it has been customary to gouge out pig's eyes so that they cannot even see where they are going. The da- dairy industry has its own ways of forcing animals to do its will. Cows, goats and sheep produce milk not only after giving birth to calves. 
kids and lambs and only as long as milk only after giving birth to calves kids and lambs and only as long as the the younger youngsters are suckling to continue a supply of animal milk a farmer needs to have calves kids or lambs for suckling but must prevent them from monopolizing the milk one common method throughout history was to simply slaughter the calves and kids shortly after birth the milk the mother for all she was worth and then get her pregnant again this is still a very widespread technique in many modern dairy farms a milk cow usually lives for about 5 years before being slaughtered during these 5 years she is almost constantly pregnant and is fertilized within 60 to 120 days after giving birth in order to preserve maximum milk production her calves are separated from her shortly after birth the females are reared to become the next generation of dairy cows whereas the males are handed over to the care of the meat industry another method is to keep the calves and kids near their mother but prevent them by various stratagem gems from sucking too much milk the simplest way to do that is to allow the kid or calf to start sucking but drive it away once the milk starts flowing their method usually encounters resistance from both kid and the mother some shepherd tribes used to kill the offspring eat its flesh and then stuff the skin the stuffed offspring was then presented to the mother so that its presence would encourage her milk production damn the newer tribe in the sudan went so far as to smear stuffed animals with their mother's urine to give the counterfeit calves a familiar life scent another newer technique was to tie a ring of thorns around a calf's mouth so that it pricks the mother and causes her to resist suckling Tuareg camel breeders in the Sahara used to puncture or cut off parts of the nose and upper lips of the young camels in order to make suckling painful thereby discouraging them from consuming too much milk. God. Not all agricultural societies were this cruel to their farm animals. The lives of some domesticated animals could be quite good. Sheep raised for wool, pet dogs and cats were horses and these horses often enjoyed comfortable conditions the roman emperor caligula allegedly planned 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 to appoint his favorite horse in incitatus to the consulship consulship shepherds and farmers throughout history showed affection for their animals and have taken great care of them just as many slave holders felt affection and concern for their slaves It was not accident that kings and prophets styled themselves as shepherds and likened the way they and the gods cared for their people to a shepherd's care for his flock. This picture is the a modern calf in an industrial meat farm. Immediately after the birth, after birth, the calf is separated from its mother and locked away inside a tiny cage, not much bigger than the calf's own body. There, the calf spends its entire life for about four months on average. It never leaves its cage, nor is it allowed to play with other calves or even walk. Also, that its muscles will grow, not grow strong. Soft muscles mean a soft and juicy steak. The first time the calf has a chance to walk, stretch its muscles, and touch other calves is on its way to the slaughterhouse. It's in evolutionary terms, cattle represent one of the most successful animal species ever to exist. at the same time they are the most they are some of the most miserable animal on the planet yet from the viewpoint of the herd rather than of the shepherd it's hard to avoid the impression that for the vast majority of domesticated animals the agricultural revolution was terrible catastrophe their evolutionary success is meaningless a rare wild rhinoceros on the brink of extinction is probably more satisfied than a calf who spends its short life inside a tiny box fattened to produce juicy steak the contented rhinoceros is no less content for being among the last of its kind the numerical success of the calf species is little consolation for the suffering of the individual and for the suffering the individual endures The discrepancy between evolutionary success and individual suffering is perhaps the most important lesson we can draw from the agricultural revolution. When we study the narrative of plants such as wheat and maize, 
may be the purely evolutionary perspective makes sense yet in the case of animals such as cattle sheep and sapiens each with a complex world of sensation and emotions we have to consider how evolutionary success translates into individual experience in the following chapters we will see time and again how a dramatic increase in the collective power and ostensible success of our species went hand in hand with much individual suffering and we'll continue from here building pyramids interesting yeah we'll read the sixth chapter from tomorrow and i will definitely read it now daily it's not like i have anything to do these days so i should now i'll go to eat we'll meet tomorrow again and right now i'm stopping it any suggestions anything do tell me in comments if you are watching if you follow if you listen to it then sure please tell me bye for now